Thanks for joining. Hi everyone, thanks for joining the first virtual Mathis core invited seminar given by Professor Yingqing Chen at Stanford Prevention Research Center and the director of Palo Alto Veteran Affairs Cooperative Studies Coordinating Center. Professor Chen has made major contributions in the development, design, management, and analysis of clinical trials and observational studies with a focus on population-based disease prevention. Among other studies he participated in, he led the Statistical Data Management Center for the HPTN 052 study, recognized as the scientific breakthrough of the year 2011 by the journal Science. Professor Chen is also recognized by being fellow of the American Statistical Association. Without further ado, let's welcome our speaker to get started. Hey. Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, I'm uh, really happy uh, to be back <laughs> to uh, talk to uh, folks uh, mostly in Seattle base. Um, so I saw um, uh, uh, our old friends and colleagues uh, also in the seminar. So I won't say hi, you know, I won't uh, say, uh, I know everyone's name, but um, uh, please, um, it's it's great to um, uh, see you all. So um, the um, I um, uh, would like to thank the uh, the center, uh, especially Brian and Angela, for uh, helping me uh, put up the slides and uh, get things going. And so um, uh, it is great. Um, so um, I um, uh, the topic I'm going to talk today is um, uh, surrogate markers and how to measure um, surrogacies in uh, clinical research. And uh, the, um, uh, um, uh, the data example, the study example I used is uh, uh, a, a landmark HIV uh, clinical trials um, for uh, treatment as prevention. So um, yeah. So this study as goal um, for those of you uh, who are working in HIV clinical trials probably know this trial very well. It's uh, uh, to compare long-term effectiveness of two uh, ARP strategies in HIV transmission amount, several discordant couples. Uh, so it is um, uh, it's to study um, uh, at that time um, if uh, immediate uh, therapy of uh, to provide HIV, uh, to provide antiretroviral drugs to um, uh, uh, HIV infected patients um, when they are yet to develop uh, serious uh, symptoms. And uh, if um, uh, early therapy or immediate therapy can uh, help prevent um, HIV transmission from HIV infected partners to uh, uh, their uh, loved ones uh, who are HIV uh, zero uh, negative uh, at that moment. Uh, so the study populations is uh, HIV discordant couples with index partners of CD4 counts between 350 to 550. And uh, when the study design, uh, when the study was first designed, it's actually uh, um, the CD4 count was between um, uh, 300 to 500. Uh, but later on, um, after we um, consulted with the DSMB and consulted with uh, you know, experts in the area, and we decided to raise the CD4 count by 50. Uh, so the enrollment of CD4 counts uh, were between 350 to uh, 550. And just, there are two treatment uh, strategies. One is the immediate therapy. So uh, it's the uh, ART initiation of how your enrollment. So which means as soon as uh, um, the index partners uh, got uh, screened and enrolled. They are, they were studying uh, the uh, ART uh, uh, at the enrollment. And the uh, uh, the comparative treatment strategy is uh, so called a delayed therapy. So it's the um, ART initiation when the index partner CD4 counts for between 200 to 250 or developing uh, AIDS defining elements. So essentially. Um, um, that was the uh, uh, treatment guidelines, especially in uh, developing uh, countries. 
uh, not necessarily in um, uh, in the U.S. though, um, but um, that was the um, uh, um, uh, the uh, de facto uh, standard of care uh, at that time. So um, uh, this trial uh, was designed to be multi-site, two-arm, control randomized uh, trial, one to one, uh, into uh, treatment versus control uh, in three continents, eight countries, twelve uh, clinical sites. It's actually four continents, nine countries, and thirteen clinical sites. If we include uh, one site uh, in uh, Boston. Um, uh, in the U.S. and uh, we uh, intended to uh, this trial to uh, have to have 1.5 year accrual with five years of follow up, and um, so each participant was supposed to uh, follow up uh, follow up for five years, so up to 6.5 years of uh, total study durations. But uh, in fact, um, the accrual. Uh, was not as fast as we um, designed it to be. It actually took about 36 months uh, for the recruit to um, uh, complete. So the total was uh, close to 10 or 11 years. Uh, if, uh, if we um, uh, count uh, the uh, study running uh, period um, uh, with about uh, 80, uh, some participants enrolled for the running period. So the primary endpoint for this study is the incident HIV infection occurred in the uh, partners of randomized HIV infected uh, um, index cases. And we only account um, supposedly in the primary analysis, uh, only a position from the index partners will be included. Uh, so each endpoint will need to be confirmed such that the viral envelope the sequence in the index case matches that of the uh, partners. So uh, we want to make sure that um, uh, if an infection happened, we can confirm uh, that infection uh, is, uh, is actually uh, uh, linked uh, between, uh, was linked between the HIV positive partner and the negative partner who later got um, um, who may later become a seropositive. So this the study population of this trial uh, uh, is mainly in um, Africa with uh, 954 uh, couples uh, recruited from Africa. Uh, in Asia, we have uh, 531 couples. In America, so we have 278 couples. Uh, but we, uh, if I remember right, it's, uh, there was only one couple from uh, uh, the US side. Uh, so here's the interim results in uh, 2011. Uh, now it's almost uh, over 10 years ago. Um, so the it's, uh, the results was um, uh, were uh, very striking. And um, the, if we uh, look, if we were looking at um, linked transmissions in the immediate arm, we had one uh, uh, transmissions in the delayed arm. We have 27 uh, transmissions observed. So the hazard ratio. Uh, is estimated to be 0 0.037. The efficacy is measured. Essentially, efficacy is a one minus test ratio of so 96%. So that the 96% uh, number was uh, uh, cited uh, um, widely uh, about uh, this um, um, the immediate uh, treatment strategy uh, uh, efficacy. And uh, we actually also look at all transmissions uh, regardless um, the transmissions uh, being linked or not. And we observed four transmissions in the immediate arm, uh, 35 transmissions in the uh, delayed arm. So the uh, hazard ratio estimated to be um, uh, 0.114. The efficacy uh, was calculated to be 88.6%. Uh, 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 so we also look at the clinical events, so which is the um, uh, we treat the uh, each uh, um, partner, uh, each uh, each uh, serial discordant couple as a one uh, tri unit. So um, the HIV positive part, uh, participant uh, may experience some clinical events plus um, the uh, transmission event that would happen to the HIV negative partner. So uh, when we look at the, the um, uh, clinical events, uh, so um, um, defined. Um, you know, uh, with some uh, criteria, we observed 40 events in the immediate arm, 65 from the delayed arm, so the hazard ratio to be uh, uh, estimated as um, uh, 0.594. Uh, 
uh, efficacy is estimated to be uh, 40 percent. So this basically says uh, means um, you know one uh, in, uh, index partner uh, of the immediate arm taking drugs uh, is not uh, only going to benefit to the um, uh, HIV negative uh, participants in terms of prevention endpoint, but also uh, it is beneficial to the uh, HIV infected partners in terms of uh, therapeutic uh, uh, endpoint. Um, so uh, it's uh, uh, and the one we uh, we also look at the so-called composite events. So those are the uh, serious uh, clinical events uh, that would happen to uh, HIV positive partner and the transmission event. So we observe. Um, uh, 23 um, uh, uh, events from uh, yeah from the immediate arm uh, from the uh, immediate arm uh, 79 uh, from the uh, delayed arm and uh, the hazard ratio to be um, uh, 0.265 uh, efficacy estimate to be 73.5 uh, percent. Um, so if we are looking at um, the serious clinical events or composite uh, events, and we actually use those composite events to monitor this trial and to uh, decide when the interim analysis uh, to be done. And this is the one we observe about um, uh, 88, 85 events. Um, uh, we actually perform this interim analysis and, um, and the, the trials um, results um, uh, were um, quickly disclosed um, to uh, the public and um, and to uh, declare the uh, benefit of um, uh, immediate therapy. But uh, since um, this trial was designed to be um, a trial to compare immediate therapy versus the delayed therapies, uh, by the time when we performed our inter interim analysis and uh, had this uh, um, uh, striking uh, results and the contrast between the two arms were already there, so um, um, we um, decided to cross in the, um, the treatment, which means um, the delayed arm uh, will um, uh, all receiving uh, um, therapies immediately um, and, and, and to still let the trial run because um, the contrast is there. And so the final um, results um, were disclosed in 2015. Um, so, um, uh, after uh, May uh, 11th or after the first interim analysis. Um, so we observe um, uh, HIV infected events uh, in the um, uh, delayed arm to be 15 and in the delayed, uh, in the early arm to be 15, in the uh, delayed arm to be 17. So it's comparable because those events are uh, accumulated already happened before. And most of those events uh, you know, happened probably during and the uh, cross in period. And uh, so um, if you look at the length, it's two versus seven. Um, and so the overall uh, uh, prevent for the prevention endpoint, uh, the length events, um, the rate ratio um, uh, between the early arm and delay arm is three versus uh, 43, uh, the hazard ratio to be 0 0.07. And if you take a one minus the hazard ratio, that's the efficacy uh, is, uh, still remains. Um, uh, to be um, uh, ninety-three percent, uh, so not far, uh, much far away from uh, ninety-six percent uh, we observed um, uh, when we performed the interim analysis. Um, the overall HIV infection, uh, regardless of length um, uh, or not, um, is a ninety uh, sixty-nine percent. So it is um, uh, still, uh, you know, a very um, striking in terms of a risk of reductions for um, um, uh, uh, for uh, immediate therapies and um, looks like it is uh, durable uh, to um, uh, somewhat degree in the trial settings. So this is the, the trial and um, you know for um, clinical trials such as HPD052 it's a, it's a long-term uh, uh, clinical trials apparently you know we um, uh, have to monitor these trials, and uh, and we uh, use the, uh, the composite endpoints we just mentioned um, uh, to monitor this trial um, and the developing monitoring plans. So the clinical the uh, the composite endpoints is um, a combination of a severe event in HIV uh, uh, positive partners 
and plus uh, uh, viral uh, transmissions uh, would happen to uh, HIV partners. So this is a, a schematic diagram um, what um, you know, an event um, may happen um, to uh, a couple uh, in the two arms. Um, and um, for um, a trial like this, and uh, it is, it, it is a, we're lucky um, to um, design this trial to be relatively long term um, and to have the resources. But for um, lots of uh, um, uh, long term trials, especially when we are dealing with uh, hard, you know, long term uh, prevention endpoint, and and it is um, somewhat desirable to find out if there is uh, surrogate endpoints we can use. Uh, uh, to or we can look at um, before uh, you know, to uh, uh, or um, uh, to uh, avoid uh, kind of collect uh, um, uh, endpoints uh, which need uh, a lot uh, more resources and time to uh, to collect. So, um, what kind of a, a surrogate endpoint uh, we should look at for? Um, uh, trial like this in uh, HIV uh, settings, I, uh, I know we have a um, uh, lot of discussions and in the literature, in um, you know, practice, uh, what should we do? And um, the interesting thing is, um, uh, there are, even though there are some agreement, but how do we um, um, assess or compare surrogate mark endpoint? It's a still um, an issue. Um, so, um, and so uh, a qualitative uh, um, evaluation of a surrogate uh, uh, endpoint um, almost always you know, takes back to um, uh, Ross Prentice's um, uh, so-called Prentice uh, criteria. So um, um, if we are using this notation, Z as intervention, S as a surrogate marker, T as a clinical endpoint. So um, conceptually, Ross, um, um, uh, um, uh, proposed this apprentice criteria in 1989 Stasi Medicine paper. So basically, um, testing of um, uh, the distribution of surrogate markers uh, uh, in the uh, different intervention arms is equivalent to test uh, the um, uh, distributions of um, uh, clinical endpoints uh, in the, the, the different treatment arms. So um, and uh, operationally, we can um, uh, look at the uh, distributions of uh, clinical endpoints uh, given uh, circular markers and intervention uh, should be uh, equal to um, the uh, distribution of clinical endpoints given circular endpoint and uh, the distribution of uh, uh, clinical endpoints in the uh, circular markers. Uh, it's uh, not the same as um, the uh, distribution of clinical endpoints itself. So, um, and ever since um, the um, apprentice criteria uh, were um, proposed, uh, people have been thinking, oh, this criteria um, is um, quite um, stringent. Um, so, in terms of biomarker uh, surrogacy, um, if uh, a marker is a perfect surrogate marker, um, uh, the so-called perfect surrogate marker, if it is, uh, captures all the dependence of T, uh, clinical endpoints on uh, the uh, intervention in the sense of um, the uh, conditional independence of um, uh, clinical endpoints um, uh, 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 with regard to the treatment assignment, but the distribution uh, of T of the clinical endpoints uh, given an intervention uh, uh, will still depend on the uh, the markers. Um, so uh, so this is a condition. This condition of a perfect surrogacy is the uh, as equivalent to apprentice criteria. Uh, and um, the um, uh, opposite uh, of this criteria, and oftentimes we call it the surrogate marker is uh, useless. Uh, so if it does not account for any dependence of T on Z in the sense of um, um, the conditional independence or uh, the marker as it's independent of the treatment. Uh, so, um, but there is a wide um, range uh, between um, these two extreme um, uh, uh, scenarios, either um, 
you know, use completely useless or um, uh, perfect circuit markers. In, um, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. And uh, there are a um, um, lot of uh, um, um, uh, scenarios a marker we identify, especially um, you know, if we're looking at um, you know, immunological uh, uh, biomarkers, and those markers is a, a, is a, can be a partial cellular markers if it captures some of the treatment effect on the clinical endpoint, but not all of that, especially when the clinical endpoint is a composite endpoint. It's not necessarily you know, uh, um, the one, um, um, the, um, um, you know, the transmission happen. Uh, so like the, uh, the uh, composite endpoint that we uh, observed, uh, we used. So um, a marker um, is not, it's neither a, a perfect surrogate marker, nor um, a use completely useless surrogate marker. So how do we um, uh, uh, assess um, uh, the partial surrogacy uh, or if we have uh, a couple of them, or if we have uh, um, uh, many of those uh, partial surrogate markers, how do we rank uh, those surrogate markers? Um, uh, it can be um, um, uh, interesting to, um, uh, to practice. So um, let's get back to uh, quality um, uh, evaluation uh, using French's criteria. So, um, Operationally, um, if we are looking at um, the uh, distribution uh, of clinical endpoints given surrogate markers and intervention, if it is equal to um, uh, prevention, uh, the distribution of uh, uh, clinical endpoints given surrogate markers, essentially this is uh, somewhat um, uh, adjusted outcomes by S, right? So, um, so basically we stratify um, the uh, the surrogate marker distributions, and then we look at the uh, uh, conditional distribution of clinical endpoints in the uh, interventions uh, in that uh, uh, stratum, and uh, we, if we can um, uh, evaluate if they are equal or not. So um, uh, the uh, this kind of adjusted uh, idea um, uh, prompts people uh, to think about um, you know how to measure surrogacy of surrogate markers. And uh, one uh, leading one uh, is uh, the so-called uh, uh, PTE. Uh, it's the, um, it's, it's the uh, proportion of treatment effect explained. Um, for example, in the binary, for the binary outcomes, people would um, uh, propose would use uh, two logistic models, um, uh, logistic regression models. So one with intervention only, the other one with intervention plus surrogate markers. And then, um, you know, to fit the two models and uh, get the regression parameter uh, parameter estimates, say um, beta uh, in the model with intervention only, uh, or um, uh, beta S uh, and uh, phi Z uh, in the uh, model with both intervention and circular markers, and then uh, take the difference. Um, between the two regression of parameter estimates and divided by the um, beta, uh, the uh, regression parameter estimate from the uh, intervention only model. And then that's called, it, it's a, this kind of a, a difference, um, uh, um, per percentage of difference um, uh, with respect to the, um, uh, the regression parameter uh, estimate from the, uh, the intervention only uh, logistic regression models. So um, basically, it is to compare um, unadjusted and adjusted model by surrogate marker distributions, regardless the underlying uh, biological mechanism in these subgroups. So this kind of approach essentially measures population impact associated with a candidate surrogate markers. So if S is the uh, represents the surrogate markers, so uh, it, it's a it's a it's a more of um, uh, um, a empirical uh, association type of uh, way of um, uh, uh, assessing the um, uh, surrogacy of uh, cellular markers as, because um, regardless of what kind of mechanism it is, regardless uh, what kind of pathway it is. So the issues on PTE is uh, for perfect markers, PTE is a one, uh, that's good. For useless markers, the PTE is a zero, that's good. <laughs> But the problem is the value of PTE alone, however, cannot determine the surrogate levels of candidate biomarkers because it's totally regardless 
uh, disregarded the, uh, the mechanism. Um, the PTE goes to one implies that good cellular markers only if it is known uh, that the intervention factor is primarily uh, mediated by a marker. But a PTE, PTE close to one may also happen when the intervention has harmful or toxic uh, effects that are not mediated via the, the biomarker. So PTE is not necessarily restricted to um, onto zero uh, um, and one range. So if in the adjusted treatment, the regression parameter changes uh, its direction, uh, then the PTE is then greater than one without some understanding of actual biological mechanism. So the uh, interpretation of uh, PTE can be quite challenging. Um, uh, uh, but nonetheless, you know, PTE offers a measure uh, of, uh, you know, um, the uh, percentage of differences uh, of regression parameters associated with the, uh, uh, the biomarker. So um, the other thing and people often criticize uh, about PTE is that PTE is model dependent, which means uh, you know, it, it really depends on the two um, uh, logistic regression models. And the issue is uh, we don't know if those two models are correct or not, or if one of them is correct uh, or both of them are correct. So both models are actually um, serving as working models. And, um, and also, um, uh, in terms of uh, the actual var variance uh, of PTE, estimated PTE, can be quite large because you know you have a regression parameter estimate in the denominator, and uh, so that uh, can uh, leads a quite large um, uh, variance. Um, so unless we you know have um, a, a big sample size and um, and then the uh, the PTE's variance um, oftentimes is, is, is too big and to uh, lead us to any um, uh, more confirmative um, uh, uh, hypothesis testing. So um, uh, so those are the issues. And then oh, hey, um, Ying. yes, so, sorry, I have a quick question. So what do you mean by like the PTE may be close to one if the intervention have some toxic effect? Is it something not captured by T? So your next slide. Uh, so like when talking about the, ra the range of PTE, so PTE when P goes to one, it may also happen when the intervention has harmful or toxic effect, not mediated with the marker. So does it mean like uh, the intervention has some other effect that's not captured by our primary outcome T? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so that's basically what it means. So if you look at, uh, it's, it just missed that part. Um, so. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are the issues. Um, and thanks for the questions, uh, Faye. So um, uh, the um, uh, the um, a second approach. So people um, are trying to um, uh, still use adjusted approach, but uh, using a model-free kind of uh, approach. So not necessarily rely on the um, the two logistic regression models. Uh, um, you know, people tend to use in the PTE um, uh, to calculate PTE. So this is a measure uh, is called um, um, the F measure um, uh, proposed by. Um, uh, Jeremy Taylor and uh, one of um, uh, his students in uh, a 202 biometrics paper. So uh, this F measure is, uh, is also actually um, uh, equivalent to a percentage uh, or proportion of uh, a treatment effect. And in, this, in their proposal, they look at um, the amount, um, uh, you know, to look at the, the, the difference um, of the uh, clinical endpoints um, in the two intervention arms, and it's actually a total effect, right? And the, the treatment effect in, on the uh, additive scales, uh, the difference of these two um, uh, distributions, and then to look at uh, what if uh, we will be using, uh, um, instead of, um, I know, um, what if we are going to apply the um, uh, conditional uh, uh, distributions of clinical endpoints uh, given a therapeutic marker in the uh, intervention arm, but uh, um, uh, to um, the uh, therapeutic marker uh, uh, distributions 
in the uh, control arm. So we have the, um, uh, the absolute risk from the, um, the control arm, uh, but can we use the, um, the absolute risk, conditional absolute risk given a circular marker, but using um, the um, control uh, arms circular marker distributions as a reference population and, and recalculate the uh, incidence that I would expect um, uh, to be um, uh, to the control arm, then take that difference. Then we can see how that difference is would compare uh, with each other uh, or the proportion of that uh, expected difference uh, uh, versus the overall uh, treatment uh, effect. And they call it uh, adjusted treatment effect uh, as, uh, as, um, through some kind of a, a direct adjustment and then take one subtract of that. And so, or more generally, um, uh, they uh, um, uh, proposed uh, this AABB and AB. So essentially it is um, a function of some kind of adjusted um, um, uh, 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 absolute risk and then uh, take um, the so-called F measure to be AA subtract AB versus uh, AA um, uh, minus BB. So if you look at AA, it's basically the, um, uh, the absolute risks given a, a marker over uh, one arm, arm A, and uh, the surrogate marker distributions in arm A, and uh, um, BB as the, um, uh, the conditional distributions given a marker given uh, in the uh, uh, arm B group and uh, apply to the RMB groups uh, surrogate marker uh, distributions. But AB is just like a, more like a cross uh, 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 over uh, using A uh, uh, in uh, one arms, um, uh, sir, uh, uh, one arms uh, distribution of clinical endpoints given uh, surrogate markers, but apply to another arms um, uh, circular marker distributions. Uh, so, so this is a, a more general um, uh, uh, formulation of the F measure um, uh, Wong and Taylor uh, proposed. So, if we look at um, that uh, in the um, in this schematic plot, so let's say if we are looking at a control arm, um, what we observe is uh, we basically uh, stratify um, the control arm into two groups, into uh, marker groups versus uh, you know. Uh, the groups without the uh, marker uh, or the uh, circular marker equals one or the other circular marker equals zero for binary circular marker. And we have the two distributions, so we can use total probability to calculate the probability of or the distribution of uh, uh, clinical events uh, in the uh, control arm. But a hypothetical group or expected group is uh, we, you know, same um, uh, kind of stratification of the markers but instead of using the, uh, the actual um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, um, marker we're gonna uh, see in that uh, control arm, but we apply um, the uh, conditional uh, distributions of uh, clinical endpoints uh, given the marker, but from the intervention arm um, to the hypothetical, uh, to, the, to the, uh, the structure of uh, markers in the control arm. So this kind of indirect adjustment for market distributions. So um, uh, in the alternative uh, form for F measure, um, in the uh, for the binary uh, marker, we can uh, rewrite it to be uh, a probability of a P clinical endpoint we observe in the intervention arm subtract a P star. So this is the uh, expected uh, 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 distribution of clinical endpoints given uh, z equals one uh, is actually uh, and over probability of the uh, t equals one uh, given z equals one. So this is the distribution of clinical endpoints in the intervention arm subtract. This is the total uh, effect that we observe. So um, we can uh, see that uh, cross uh, crossing or cross uh, uh, product. Uh, to be an um, expected uh, event uh, um, with uh, control arm uh, uh, circular marker uh, structure. Uh, so we apply that. 
So that's the differences. And um, the ratio of the, these two differences uh, is actually the uh, F measure. So um, F measure, um, you know, as it is formulated, um, it is formulated as a model free. It does not rely on um, uh, any uh, um, uh, 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 models. And, uh, uh, but, uh, but it still does not solve all the uh, PD issues. Uh -huh. The strong assumption of biological mechanisms are still necessary for it to be bounded on uh, uh, onto a zero one. And when there is, a, uh, again, same uh, issues when there is unexpected reverse uh, treatment effect, given some circular values, the F measure may lie out uh, zero and one. Uh, the variance of the estimated F measure can, uh, you know, also can be large. Uh, superficial uh, solution uh, is uh, transforming the F measure by this transformation to one over one plus one over F minus one. Uh, squared and it's kind of a, there's a, actually a special term for that. It's called the PCS. Uh, it uh, stands for uh, proportion of treatment effect captured by candidate circle marker endpoints, um, uh, coined by uh, Fumiyaki and uh, uh, Kuruki in 2014. Stats in medicine. So um, there are issues too. Uh, you know, with even with the transformed uh, F measure. So different situations may, may lead to same uh, PCS values. So it is challenging to use uh, PCS to rank um, uh, candidate survey markers uh, as well. And especially when you have this uh, uh, square term. So um, um, yeah. there are, those are the- I'm sorry, Ying, I just wanna let you know it's 10 after 11. You asked me to keep a time. Okay, great, thank you, uh, right. So in terms of the suppressing, uh, uh, you know, the HPD052 examples of suppressing, we know suppressing viral load is how ART controls AIDS-related events progression and uh, potentially HIV transmissions. And so uh, essentially it, uh, the, there is a strong biological mechanism uh, we um, uh, believe or we have evidence and uh, antiretroviral therapies will work on viral load and the viral load, uh, you know, lower viral load will lead to uh, slower disease progression and uh, lower risk of HIV transmission. So um, that's the, um, the, the good news uh, to, um, uh, apply, to apply F measure um, uh, in, uh, onto um, uh, HPD-052 studies because we do have this kind of strong biological mechanisms. So we look at the viral load greater than one K copies at year one as surrogate markers, and we uh, can assess, for example, survival status by year three. Um, so uh, we can also look at the, the viral loads at year one survival status uh, uh, three, and uh, with the, uh, the the severe endpoint uh, in HIV positive in each, uh, uh, events in HIV positive partner and HIV transmission event happens to HIV. Negative one, so we can extend F measures to uh, even time varying, not just binary outcomes. And so um, we uh, pick up a specific time and look at beyond that time, uh, C and uh, what the surrogate marker would look like. So this T can be a landmark time, and the C is actually the survival time. So we can use the denominator, the total uh, effect in the risk set, and then we adjust it um, the um, uh, to calculate differences uh, by adjusted uh, treatment effect in the risk set. So um, this is a, a schematic plot, plot of that um, time varying F measure uh, um, for a useless to partial markers. So, so the flat lines, the useless biomarkers would be uh, 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 represented by that time varying functions and um, you know, for different partial markers. And this on the right uh, is the, um, um, the perfect two partial markers. The perfect marker is the solid lines and uh, the partial markers, how the partial markers may compare to that perfect markers. So um, we can um, uh, we can certainly estimate and uh, make inferences for uh, categorical biomarkers. So we can assume uh, random sensoring and survival properties can be estimated by Kaplan-Meier estimates. The market distribution can be estimated by empirical distributions. And then we um, uh, worked out all the technical details uh, to uh, calculate the, the symptotics um, uh, for this time varying measures. 
So uh, we uh, did run some simulations using Cox Weibull distributions, uh, basic Cox model uh, with a Weibull uh, underlying uh, baseline um, uh, distribution. And we run on uh, 20,000 subjects, so 1,000 replicate simulations. So when you look at the coverage of probabilities, it um, um, works pretty well at, um, for different uh, scenarios. Uh, so for the F measure in the, for the HPTN 052 studies, so we um, uh, uh, so this is a table on, um, uh, to show um, at a different landmark time, uh, year two, three, four, five, six, seven, and in the delayed arm, what is going on in the delayed arm, what's going on in the immediate arm in terms of uh, the prevalence of uh, viral loads more than uh, 1,000 copies among HIV infected partners and how the F measure would be uh, calculated. So for year two, it's um, uh, 0 0.18, uh, year three, 0 0.041, uh, year um, four is 0.52, year uh, five is 0.72, year six, 1.12, and year seven is 0.812. And, and it looks like the um, surrogacy is as time progresses and the, uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, viral copies more than 1,000 uh, among HIV infected partners uh, uh, getting better, better close to the clinical endpoints, you know, as you can imagine, right? So it's not surprising. Um, and, 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 you know, still, you know, um, because the uh, uh, get to the end of the study, so we have less number of events, uh, clinical events uh, to be active. So the range of the confidence will become big. And also we have this auto range value of, uh, you know, even more than one. So, um, so that is the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the um, one extension we did using F measure, but extended to the time varying, uh, uh, scenario. So with uh, multiple landmark time. And then the other thing is that we um, want to understand uh, what is the, um, what is the really uh, 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 F measure really um, uh, doing? So if we can recall F measure, the numerator basically is the difference of uh, what we observed uh, and what we expected um, using control arm as the, um, uh, the reference group. So then it will be actually the same as the numerator of so-called population attributable fractions if the treatment assignment were considered as an exposure of interest in the uh, epidemiological investigation. So this is uh, the uh, population proportion of attributable fractions. If you look at the, denom uh, the numerators, they are almost identical. The only difference is, is the denominator. Uh, in the population attributable fractions, it's uh, just uh, you look at the uh, the absolute risk of a disease, regardless of uh, exposure, right? But in the F measure, you basically take the denominator as the total the difference of the total effect. Uh, so in fact, the F measure is equivalent to uh, attributable fractions by a factor. Uh, so. Um, and this factor is the ratio of percent of a reduction of immediate endpoint exposure by treatment arm, and the uh, RD is um, is an, uh, another measure. So uh, then we um, uh, move on to say, how, can we just uh, look at the you know uh, the uh, the population true fractions uh, counterpart um, directly? Uh, look at the, the so-called the row measure. So basically, we take the difference of the um, uh, the uh, observed and expected. But over uh, the um, uh, the uh, absolute risk in the uh, intervention arm, so then it just becomes just uh, uh, the attributable fractions. So uh, it provides an empirical absolute information of the moderated risk uh, associated with the different market distributions with a range of zero one for protective treatment effect. So now uh, this row measure, uh, unlike F measure, may go beyond. Um, you know, one uh, be greater than one. This row measure is like a proportion, uh, 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 fraction, uh, 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 the uh, proportion of treat uh, of uh, attributable fractions is uh, uh, actually uh, will always uh, be between zero and one. So here is an example for bi binary circuit markers in the two arm trial, and um, so um, you know we have uh, control arm, treatment arm, marker distributions. 
for clinical endpoints, we look at subtotals. So if we assume uh, more to normal uh, uh, you know, distributions, uh, and then um, the row measure is just a you know differences uh, as a denominator as a numerator over the absolute risks in the intervention arm as a denominator. We can estimate it. We can estimate the uh, confidence intervals. It's a it's a it's a long uh, form, but it's doable. Um, so um, we can actually um, you know use that um, relationship to assess what's the um, uh, 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 the relationship between the PT uh, high measure or the uh, F measure and this new row measure. And here are the, uh, the graphs, some schematic graphs. So row measure is essentially it's just F measure up to a factor of one subtract one over relative risk. Uh, so the row measure in the HPT 052 studies so if we compare immediate versus delay, and here are different markers we want to compare. I know this plot, this uh, table is pretty busy, but we did look at the different combinations. So instead, uh, you know, um, in addition to the uh, viral load, we also add on um, add the CD4 counts as a markers and the different combinations and different levels, and to look at how. Um, the you know different comment to mimic you know what if we have different kind of candidate markers we would be looking at and we can pack we can pack it you know their distributions in the delay arm in the immediate arm and then uh, we can calculate the, you know the, uh, the PTE the F measure and the row measure uh, for different combinations and uh, you know it's not surprising uh, to see F measure and row measure are um, pretty much equivalent. Um, but only by a factor of one minus one uh, of relative risks. Um, so those are the, the results. I'm not, I'm not going to go through uh, you know, each one of them. And basically, um, we did a look at um, you know, um, how do we uh, rank them. And it looks like um, you know, uh, if you look at pick up a number, um, let's say um, at a year um, uh, two, look at the viral load uh, of less than 400 versus viral load of, of less than 1,000, the F measure gives to almost a perfect uh, uh, surrogacy uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, surrogate, uh, their, uh, 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 them as a surrogate markers. And the, um, the row measure also, um, you know, even on the different directions, but the, the, if you look at the magnitude, they're about the same. So, um, in our paper, um, we discussed, we actually also discussed the, the relationship between the real measure and the, the natural uh, direct effect and the natural indirect effect under the counterfactual um, uh, framework. There is a, a connection between these two. If, uh, for example, the, um, uh, in a, a confounding free scenarios, uh, the numerator of the real measure actually captures the indirect effect to be able to do the marker immediate pathway. Um, in that uh, scenario. So the row measure is the proportion risk reduction that attributed to the marker mediated treatment effect, which entails a, a natural indirect effect in the patient. Um, so uh, in randomized clinical trials and probably um, um, with a strong biological mechanism like in uh, 052, we know CD4, the viral load directly related to the, uh, the clinical endpoints and the, the transmission endpoints. So um, the row measure provides empirical you know, sensible um, uh, interpretation. So, uh, you know, for biomarker surrogacy um, uh, assessment, uh, there are other approaches as well. You know, um, there are meta analytic approaches, uh, causal effect approaches. So, um, it's uh, there. Um, there's a lot of um, literatures on that, and um, it's uh, it's uh, it's not limited to use PTE or F measure, um, and uh, the um, the um, uh, uh, the how come? Uh, so that's um, um, uh, basically what we um, have um, for um, uh, have done for the um, uh, assessing surrogate markers for this uh, uh, important clinical studies. And um, um, so I would like to thank uh, you know HPT052 study participants and the protocol team. And our funders, uh, Bates um, from NIAID, uh, NIH. And especially, I would like to thank um, our UW Hutch colleagues. And I have been working with UW Hutch uh, between uh, 2004 and uh, till last year. And uh, many, many of 
uh, my colleagues at Hutch and UW, um, we had a lot of discussions and uh, conversations about um, on these issues. Uh, many, many productive uh, conversations with Ross, Tom, and Jim. I saw you uh, are there, and uh, Deborah Donnell, and uh, Peter Gilbert, and certainly Gary and Chongji. And uh, thanks so much for your conversation, for your um, help. Uh, so with that said, I probably can uh, answer some of the questions if you have. Thank you very much, Jim. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you clap in Zoom <laughs> seminars, but uh, maybe if people have questions, they could do the hand raise thing. Oh, Gary's doing it. Thank you. Um, or if there, someone just wants to pipe up with any questions. I have a question, mm -hmm. uh, just to get us going. I was wondering, um, so because the, um, well, I'm, I'm just wondering if you could use this approach to um, look at the optimal viral load, for instance, Yang, um, that uh, would, would be associated with the greatest um, uh, impact on your outcome. So instead of using arbitrary cut points like 1,000 or 400. That's a very good question. And, uh, you know, one um, direct application certainly is that if we do have some uh, meaningful, uh, you know, uh, uh, way or, uh, you know, to make the, to do the cutoffs, so we can compare them, right? We can just calculate um, the, um, the uh, F measure or um, uh, the real measure for each cutoff, then we can uh, run hypothesis testings because we already calculated the, um, uh, the asymptotics. And the other thing is that, you know, uh, how do we figure out what is the optimal based on that? We can certainly use this F measure or row measure as objective functions and for a given cutoff. And then we can, you know, optimize the wizards uh, with uh, respect to the cutoff. But oftentimes the thing is, um, is that when we uh, run that kind of, op uh, you know, uh, uh, optimization, it's uh, more or less a study dependent, uh, depending on what kind of data we have. And can we use that uh, optimal cutoff we uh, got it from the study to another study? Um, sometimes it's uh, hard to to uh, to to, um, uh, to adjudicate, <laughs> and uh, so that's why you know in reality people just tend to use a one cutoff. Let's say you know uh, it's more or less like an age cutoff. You use uh, you know five year or three year and why five year or three year it's, uh, it's there's no like a hard uh, clear cut why we're doing so. So I I uh, I, I think the, the other uh, way of looking at it is uh, probably you know the, the look at the, at the different studies uh, probably through a meta analytic approach uh, and um, uh, to look at it. and uh, but then certainly the issue is uh, you know there are um, uh, different inclusion exclusion criteria, a different uh, quality, the amount of different studies, and how do we uh, get that settled? And, uh, there are uh, issues. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to see a meta analysis of some sort on that, just because it would have some practical implications in terms of counseling patients. Um, mm -hmm. If there was sort of a range or sort of an, an area, you could say, well, you know, in terms of your personal health, keeping mm -hmm. your viral load below such and such a cut point looks like it might be, um, you know, optimal. Mm -hmm. Whereas for HIV transmission risk, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's higher or lower in terms mm -hmm. of what they what they shoot for. And to some patients, that might make a difference in how they think about uh, suppression and adherence. Yeah, yeah, and and um, you know, we didn't really talk about um, the adherence and the compliance issues in uh, this talk yet. I uh, you know it's later time we have more time to um, uh, to interact. I can uh, show you other work we we uh, did. Um, um, how do we monitor viral load over time in terms of uh, their compliance issues and um, and how that would affect their uh, clinical endpoints? And yeah, it's a it's a it's a tough issue though. So uh, <laughs> any other questions?
Uh, one thing I thought of while you were answering Susan's question, besides optimizing a viral load as a surrogate, you might you want to optimize the time window too. Like in a lot of mediation research and developmental research, the timing of measurement is often just an art, artifact of the research design and the funding and how often you can collect data rather than focused on the unfolding process and what the time of all these different things are and when the optimal moments of capturing associations mm -hmm. are. And that's a hard thing to figure out. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very good um, uh, question, Brian. Is, uh, you know, in clinical trial settings, we somewhat have that kind of luxury, right? Uh, we uh, ask patients to come into a clinic every you know, four weeks, every six weeks, or every three months or quarterly, or, you know, we have that kind of luxury. In the pure observational settings, not necessarily we can have that kind of luxury. And so the timing of, uh, of doing that can be quite challenging. Um, yeah, and uh, it is, um, it's a, it's a, you know, circular marker uh, has been uh, there and the statisticians have dedicated so much time and effort to trying to study it, you know, via, all kinds of approaches, um, uh, you know, or um, you know, structural equation models and to uh, run joint modeling. And it uh, has been uh, quite sticky. Um, and even today, it's uh, still hard. And uh, in HIV prevention trials, and I believe, you know, uh, the uh, hard clinical endpoint of transmission is still the gold standard. You know, people would like to do that. It's just, uh, you know, um, and, 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 a, and a somewhat a lucky, um, we um, uh, know very well in the treatment as prevention settings, and we know the viral load is, is the key issues. So, um, so um, but for in other settings, um, when the, the things are not so clear, especially for example, in HIV vaccine studies, when you have you know, different kind of immunological biomarkers and we're not so sure which one really uh, can, uh, um, which one is the, the, the the clear winner for um, uh, as a, a circuit marker for HIV vaccines, then it is uh, it is hard. So, but at least uh, you know we want to rank, um, you know, uh, those candidate markers. Um, it's it's all about the, you know competing your interests, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, how do we um, uh, rank them using a uniform or consistently defined measure? I, I think you know it's still um, useful, helpful. Thanks. I guess one one other. I'm going to jump in since uh, while while other folks are thinking. One other thing that occurred to me is that this is somewhat. It, it, you basically are going from the intention to treat analysis to an approach that's sort of more analogous to per protocol. Um, where in which the uh, the intent to treat and the surrogate marker are more aligned with what actually happened in the trial. Um, and so, you know, there's some, I guess, I guess it's, it's sort of like uh, moving towards what may be most explanatory, but may not be achievable in the real world. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to look at it. So basically, what we are doing here, or people are lo looking at here, is uh, you know you see the difference between the measurement arm and the control arm, right? And you just want to understand what this marker's role uh, uh, in that difference you are saying. So basically, you know, the F measure is saying, well, it's the same idea as in the uh, PTE uh, formulation, right? Is uh, if we look at the intention to treat uh, differences, and then um, we add now add in uh, surrogate markers, and then we calculate the, the adjusted uh, treatment effect, and then we can compare those two. So basically, that's the idea. So that's why the the the, the philosophy is the is the, the same. Uh, um, it's just provide an empirical measure, but the um, the the. It, the, the issue is it does not really um, incorporate what's really going on with the, the markers and the interventions and the clinical endpoints. So, um, so I think, you know, to uh, really trying to understand the, uh, the causal uh, relationship um, between intervention marker and uh, clinical endpoints, 
And I think definitely more detailed modeling are needed, uh, you know, uh, regardless if it's more conventional pathway analysis or um, more um, uh, kind of factuals, kind of uh, put in the kind of factual settings to uh, estimate the causal uh, estimate, to, you know, to propose a, a meaningful causal estimate and to estimate it. And, and so, or to even run uh, 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 or, or, or simulate uh, um, uh, uh, clinical studies and to check different assumptions um, and to, to look at, you know, uh, to wiggle a bit and to find out what really go, what's really going on. And um, sometimes it's, it's a bit, to me, it's a bit beyond the statistical scope. Um, it's a, it requires additional knowledge. Uh, to do that, but this measure, like you said, is basically just to look at you know uh, the uh, the overall uh, difference you see how much would be uh, explained by um, circular markers uh, in the association sense. It strikes me as something as as we're a, the Birch Center and we're looking at mental health. Mental health is a outcome for which the causal pathways and the potential surrogate markers are much much less clear. For instance, than HIV treatment, and you know the idea that you know this is somewhat like a mediation analysis, but you know just the idea that we need to try and and um, dig into the potential surrogate markers that might actually help people achieve mental health outcomes, whether biologic or scale-based measures, um, I think it's really an interesting area. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree, especially for a lot of uh, endpoints in mental health research, it's, uh, it's not uh, simple. I mean, even to look at an endpoint, it's not simple. It's a, it's a combination of a lot of things, right? And, and also, on the other hand, there is a lot of science going on, uh, you know, to lead to that uh, uh, endpoint or to lead to that uh, step status. So trying to use one single circuit marker in mental health research um, um, to, you know, study uh, endpoint uh, can be quite challenging. And uh, I, I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, if we, let's say, if we do have, um, some markers were interested, especially for long-term studies. Uh, if we do want to look at a combination of things and we want to rank them, and those measures can probably still be helpful in terms of um, you know providing some you know comparisons for us to uh, move into, right? Um, yeah. Sounds like the start of an R twenty one. It's a, it's a very right interesting, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a very interesting, uh, the, um, the, um, this kind of a idea, it's actually not new. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very old, uh, uh, for, uh, any, you know, epidemiology 101 students, uh, trying to learn to, you know, to, uh, do, um, uh, uh indirect, indirect adjustment and how do we take the expected given, uh, and then, uh, how do we assess that? Uh, so, essentially, um, uh, how do we um, do uh, surrogate markers? And probably we'll have to dig into the very old ideas of uh, adjustment. And uh, what do we mean about, by adjustment? What do we mean by expected uh, versus uh, observed? And uh, what kind of scales we want to use? Should we use uh, you know, difference? Should we use uh, ratios? And so, uh, how do we interpret those uh, things? And, um, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, to me uh, how you know old ideas are still very useful in terms of uh, developing uh, new things. Yeah. Anyone else?
Someone said to me a long time ago, when you ask if there are any questions, count to 15 seconds in your head and it feels like an eternity. That's one thing I learned from Tom Fleming is, uh, you know, when after that 15 seconds, you just say two words, hearing none, let's move on. <laughs> which, which we can certainly do. <laughs> well, thank you, Ying, very much for your thank time. You, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Susan. Well, I, I hope people enjoyed this. And this is again, our first Birch speaker for seminar and uh, there should be more coming and uh, thank you very much again thank you yang and thank you everyone for coming thank you bye bye take care okay. everyone bye